thanks so much for joining us with Hims TV. I'm Laura Levitt, and today we have on with us Dr. John Torres, who is the director of the Digital Psychiatry Lab at Beth Israel. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So I'd love to start off. Um, you just published a study in JMIR, and I'd love to hear a little bit about it. It's talking about mental health, and it's talking a little bit about how the coronavirus is impacting telehealth in this. Our team published a paper in JMIR Mental Health, and we kind of looked at how with this kind of global pandemic going on, what is the utility of different kind of video and telecommunication technologies to improve health and specifically mental health? And what we focused on is that we're seeing the amazing utility of telehealth, especially telepsychiatry right now, to connect patients and clinicians, even when we can't see each other face to face or social distancing. What we also talked about is that there's potential for things like smartphone apps to kind of augment and extend care even further? And how do we actually make sure that things like mobile health actually work really well with telehealth? And I think what we kind of argue in the paper is that telehealth is stepping up today in a crisis. It's so useful because there's really decades of high quality evidence, research, and experience with it. And because of that, the federal government was willing to kind of waive regulations and prior barriers around telehealth. I think we're seeing that really to kind of fully utilize mobile health, digital sensor, smartphone apps. We as a kind of field country society have to really commit to being very serious and rigorous around mobile health as well. Yeah, and, you know, I'm interested. A lot of us are sort of stuck inside right now. And, you know, what are sort of the challenges you see around mental health and, and keeping that mental well-being while sort of being stuck inside? And, you know, how do you think digital can sort of play into that? I mean, what are you seeing as applications and, and what are your suggestions? Well, I think it's certainly a challenging time for everyone. And I think the uncertainty about how everyone is feeling, that worrying about families, some people are worried about jobs, with schools being closed, children, there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of new responsibilities on people. And that type of stress certainly primes all of us to kind of be at higher risk of experiencing mental disorders, of having exacerbations or relapse of mental disorders. I think what makes it really tricky with social distancing is some of those things that we know we should do, like kind of go to sleep at a regular time, exercise, be active, not use substances like minimize alcohol use. Sometimes in kind of situations like this, those kind of healthy habits or kind of lifestyle interventions are a little bit harder to follow through with, but yet are all the more critical right now because, again, we're under so much more stress and with so much uncertainty. And I think technology can help to some extent. I think one useful thing that we're telling all of our patients that we're seeing right now is it can be useful to even just be tracking your symptoms, to be tracking your mood, and to be tracking things that you're doing, kind of develop a little bit of emotional self-awareness. What's happening in this unique time? What are the things, what are the good days you had? What are the bad days? What was kind of triggering anxiety before? A lot of apps you can kind of use and just kind of track your mood, track your life events, and kind of get some personal insight into what, what's happening. And that alone can be very effective. And again, it doesn't have to be super high tech. Yeah, and I think one thing that's really interesting is there are a lot of apps out there people can can you know tap into. There's a lot of meditation apps, that kind of thing. Um, I know you've talked a lot about evaluating apps. So you know, what would you suggest to people in order to, to go through and evaluate these apps and sort of look at you know, what's right for them and, and that kind of thing? Yeah, so I would say just like diff people respond differently to exercise, to medications, to therapy, there's no one perfect app. There's no list that can tell you this is kind of the best app, just like there's no, again, best therapy, best medication, best diet, best exercise regime. I think what you want to do is just kind of be asking the right questions, kind of having an open mind, but a little bit skeptical. And I think if you kind of Google and APA App Evaluation Framework or American Psychiatric Association, APA App Evaluation Framework, we actually have a couple of videos and tutorials up online to kind of help you make a smarter choice when looking at these apps. And very quickly, there's just four things to keep in mind. The first is kind of privacy and security. If you're giving all this data about your mental health to an app, maybe you're letting it know your GPS, where you sleep at night, you probably do want to check the terms and conditions this time because that's a lot of sensitive data you may be giving up. And you may be surprised that that app isn't kind of protecting your data like a healthcare app would. It may be a wellness device. So you want to check the security and privacy, make sure your data, you know where it goes. 
evidence base. A lot of these apps don't have strong evidence. That's okay. But you want to make sure if you're not feeling well, you do actually try to connect with someone now, say via telehealth, reach out to someone, or if you're using an app and it does have an evidence base, you really want to know what you're using and can you expect it to work. I think there's a lot of apps out there where people try to make a great therapy program, but they kind of aren't really therapy and you end up just wasting your time. And again, if you're not feeling well, wasted time is not a good thing. You could actually be getting effective help then. So check the privacy, looking at what the evidence is. The third is usability. There was a really interesting study by someone called Amit Bamul. He published it in November of this year, and he looked at engagement with apps. After two weeks, people who download kind of these mindfulness, these breathing, these meditation apps, how many people were using them two weeks later? And the data he found was only 4% of people were actually still sticking with it. So it's kind of saying just because you download an app, you probably want to have a game plan of how you're going to engage with it, how you're going to stick with it. Sometimes just like a gym buddy can help you keep accountable to the gym. You may want an app buddy as well, something to keep you engaged and using it. The fourth thing is thinking about, so you thought about privacy, a little about evidence, a little about engagement. The fourth one is, how is this app? Are you going to be able to control your data? Can you keep it? Can you share it with maybe a therapist later on? What is the purpose? What are you using the app for? Is it just kind of getting your data out of this thing? Or are you just kind of siloing your information in one thing? Yes, we have a lot of information on the psychiatric app evaluation website. We have videos. I think just by thinking hard about these things, if anything, it can help pass a little bit of time of kind of comparing and contrasting these apps. But there are good ones out there that can help people. And you just want to avoid those ones where, again, you go, oh, my gosh, I gave it my social security number, my address, and my GPS. And what happened to my data? Yeah. And you know what I'm interested in, too, is a lot of clinicians are sort of transferring to telehealth, to digital services for their, their patients. And, you know, clients, what do you suggest or do you have any tips for, for them on, you know, transferring and what's different and, and how to sort of bridge that? Because it is like a different medium. I mean, I think it's a little bit different for, you said, both for kind of patients and clients and both for kind of mental health providers. A lot of people, both sides are still learning. And I think for clients and kind of for patients, I think it's always important if you're kind of doing a video visit to think about, are you in a space that's private and secure? Surprisingly, being in your car, if it's parked outside, can sometimes be a really good place to do a video visit. If you want somewhere that's quiet and protected, it's also things like think about is if you're calling from your smartphone, is my battery charged to kind of go through a whole visit? Are things going to work? I think it's a lot of privacy. But in some ways, as a patient kind of doing these video visits, you can expect to kind of get the same high quality care. You can kind of expect hopefully the same interaction, the same format. It's more just a different medium to connect with. And I think also what we're seeing is a lot of therapists, social workers, nurse practitioners, psychiatrists, your specialists that are kind of offering video services now today, they're kind of going, hey, this is new, but it's kind of easy. It's, it's different. And I think one thing that a lot of people are learning is something that someone else once labeled website manner. We've heard of bedside manner. Yeah. <laughs> website manner is kind of how do you develop therapeutic rapport kind of over video? When you're not in the same room, it's important to kind of think about, well, probably not to wear a checkered shirt like I'm wearing because it doesn't come out as well on video, but to think about what is your background? Are you making eye contact with the camera instead of looking at where you are on the screen or going up, down, and left? Of thinking about how is the audio projecting? Do you have a high quality internet connection? There's a lot of subtle things that, again, people may not always think about when you're kind of connecting face to face. I think kind of thinking about what are those kind of non- those nonverbal cues are probably even more important kind of developing that strong therapeutic alliance and rapport over video. The other thing is I'd love to bring up, we talked a little bit at your lab about green spaces and you've been researching green spaces. So I'd love to hear about that. And then, you know, also talking a little bit about how green spaces is impact during this time when we're kind of asked to stay more indoors and a lot of parks are being closed. Um, yeah, so maybe you could kind of give me an overview and then some thoughts on right now. Yeah, so our group has done some very interesting research in part still ongoing of looking at from people's smartphones, we can actually get an idea of your exposure to green space. How much time are you spending in areas of a lot of trees, parks and grass versus how much kind of 
concrete parking lot, skyscraper, city buildings. And what we do in a show kind of using smartphones is that people with higher exposure to green space had kind of lower symptomology and mental health symptoms compared to people that weren't in as much green space. And certainly now with self-quarantine and kind of social distancing, it can be a little bit harder to get out, to get to parks. In some cases, it may actually be illegal right now. And I think what that really brings up is it's all the more important to kind of be aware of other kind of things that we're doing lifestyle-wise, such as sleep, such as, again, trying to get a little bit of exercise, even as kind of walking, thinking about diet, all these things that we know are kind of important, but we don't always do them. Even just kind of the routines that we have, the fact that we would be kind of talking to people, calling them, kind of realizing that we're in a pretty dynamic time and there's a lot of things that we're probably protecting, augmenting, helping our mental health, even if we didn't see it. We kind of had a lot of things that were helping us kind of behind the scenes, helping us feel good. And as those kind of go away again, it can be useful to kind of be aware of our moods, be aware of anxiety. And again, I think that's where charting it out and kind of looking at it and noticing what patterns you are seeing can be really important and helpful in a first step. And again, even if you're feeling well, it can be a useful thing to kind of say, hey, maybe I could be feeling actually a little bit better or kind of thriving even more by, by doing something. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. We talked a lot about isolation, but there's also a lot of anxiety kind of coming with this. And there's a lot of, you know, frontline workers who know they have to keep going into this situation. You know, are you seeing that, you know, there's an uptake in, you know, usage for different digital tools and different people um, kind of seeking help for that in, you know, in terms of just anxiety over the whole situation? Or what are you seeing with that? So I think you're definitely right. There's a lot more anxiety, which means there's going to be a lot more people seeking help. What's really tricky about, especially in a mobile app space and digital app space, a lot of these companies aren't sharing with us the data of who's actually using it, or they may kind of tell us, they may put up press release saying we've had more updates, or sorry, they may put up press release say we've had more downloads. But as we talked about, do downloads actually mean kind of meaningful use? Did people download it because they tried to download every app and see which one they used? So we actually don't yet have good data on kind of what digital tools people are using and which ones are effective. And it's too bad because knowing that would really help us match the right person to the right tool. But at this point, I think we, we, we we're pretty sure people are seeking more things. We just don't know what they're finding and if they're finding it useful. Yeah, that's really interesting. And do you have any other thoughts, um, you know, just on the situation or, or digital's role in it um, before we wrap up? So I think what we are seeing as one silver lining of this is I think we're seeing a lot of clinicians on the, on the mental health system, a lot of patients now kind of using telemental health or telepsychiatry or video visits for the first time, and really overall having what I've seen anecdotally good experiences. People kind of saying, hey, this wasn't too hard to get up and running. It seemed effective. It was great to connect with someone so easily. So I think that we're going to see a lot more interest in kind of telemental health continue even after the current crisis and pandemic. I think that we've kind of have got the critical mass of people on board all at the same time. So I think in the paper we said, you know, we need to flatten the curve on the virus. If now we probably want to accelerate the curve on telemental health and get pe more people using it. And I think as telemental health expands, we're going to see mobile health expand with it because you can bring so much interesting data into a telemental health visit. You kind of bring in your mood tracking, your step tracking, your sleep. So I think that mobile health is going to have a really exciting opportunity to augment and expand health, which is going to become more and more popular. And this is something we've been doing in our digital clinic. We've been working on it before, and in part, it's working really well now during the crisis with patients that we're working with. We're able to kind of learn about their lived experience. We're able to kind of answer the right questions. So I think we're going to see this model of care with in-person visits as we can have them, when we have them back, but also more, more focus on telehealth and mobile health. So I think that you guys are going to be very busy at Hims TV and in mobile <laughs> zoos because I think this is only going to accelerate in a good way for the field and for patients.